This is Corporate Warrior, high-intensity training lifestyle and business with Lawrence Neal, helping you improve your health and physique, become a great personal trainer, and start and grow your hit business. This episode is brought to you by ARX, the most innovative, efficient, and effective all-in-one exercise machines I have ever seen. I was really impressed with my ARX workout. The intensity and adaptive resistance was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I love how the machine enables you to increase the negative load to fatigue target muscles more quickly. And I love how the workouts are effortlessly quantified. The software tracks maximum force output, rate of work, total amount of work done and more in front of you on screen, allowing you to compete with your previous performance to give you and your clients real-time motivation. The ARX uses a computer-controlled motor to give you the exact amount of resistance your clients need 100% of the time. This means that the resistance can never become dangerous, is intuitive and simple to use, and can provide you with all of the results you and your clients are looking for in a fraction of the time. ARX is highly effective and efficient in delivering all of the benefits of exercise, including increased strength, muscle mass, cardiovascular conditioning, bone mineral density, and injury recovery. As well as being utilized by many high-intensity trainers to deliver highly effective and efficient workouts to their clients, ARX comes highly recommended by world-class trainers and brands, including Bulletproof, Tony Robbins, and Ben Greenfield Fitness. To find out more about ARX and get $500 off install when you place an order, please go to arxfit.com and mention Corporate Warrior and How Did You Hear About Us field. So again, to get $500 off install when you order, head on over to arxfit.com and enter Corporate Warrior and How Did You Hear About Us field. Lawrence Neal here and welcome back to CorporateWarrior.co. My guest today is Craig Hartley. Craig is the owner of Potential, a high-intensity training gym in Yorkshire in the UK. And he's also the author of a book called Potential, The Keys to Unlocking Your Genetic Potential, which is all about his high-intensity training methods to help you get great results. You can connect with Craig over on Instagram. His handle is at Potential Gym. Uh, or you can go to his website, which is potentialgym.co.uk. Craig's expertise is in using high intensity training and more specifically, ensuring the precise amount of exercises performed with the right frequency and tailored nutrition plans to help his clients build muscle, burn fat, prepare for bodybuilding contests and fitness modeling contests alike, and improve health and well being. I really enjoyed chatting with Craig. This was a lot of fun and a very wide-ranging conversation all about high-intensity training. We start off by talking about Craig's story, how he got into here, his influences, which is always interesting to me because there seems to be a common theme in the characters and names that crop up uh, who are the heroes for a lot of the people who are really into hit these days. Um, We talk about Craig's near-death experience, which is related to uh, a serious heart issue he had. Um, and this is a very, very interesting indeed. And we talk about the potential cause of the, the, the health scare um, and what he thinks may have uh, contributed and potentially saved his life. Um, so we talk all about that. Um, we talk a lot about uh, long-term bulking and muscle gain potential and genetics. Craig has gained a significant amount of weight over his training career. I do challenge Craig a lot, as you would expect me to, uh, as I'm sure you will challenge him in the comments anyway. Uh, and we, we talk a lot about his extraordinary achievement in his own weight game um, over the years. Um, you know, the amount, the, the role that genetics has played in that versus his training and his diet and so on and so forth. Um, we, we talk a lot about the tactical. We really dive into Craig's specific training routines in immense detail. So if you're really interested in learning from someone who's been in high intensity training for decades, who's played around with lots of different tactics and variables to try and get the most out of their training, then you're going to really enjoy this because I really do dig into the details with Craig about his training, about the protocol, the frequency, recovery, all of that stuff. 
Um, one final caveat, I did record this long before my interviews with Doug McGuff on Bulking Up. Um, so please bear that in mind um, when you're listening to this, because as you may have known, uh, listening to the introductions to some of the, the recent podcasts is that some of these episodes um, have been uh, published out of sequence. Uh, and that was a mistake by me. Uh, I actually recorded those episodes with Doug and I published them literally a week or two later uh, for various reasons. But that really did affect the sequencing of episodes and, and probably confuses you guys a little bit because you'll hear me perhaps contradict myself. So do bear that in mind when you're listening to this. This did get recorded before I spoke to Doug about bulking up, which has a big impact on how I look at things now in terms of how I eat and train for um, for long-term muscular growth. For the show notes for this one, please go to corporatewarrior.co forward slash potential. That's not .com, that's .co forward slash potential. And now without any further ado, I give you Craig Hartley. Craig, welcome to Corporate Warrior. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Thank you. Oh, it's good to talk to someone from Yorkshire, someone in the UK. It <laughs> uh, makes a difference because, um, you know, 99.9% of the high intensity training community are all in the US. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, and Canada, I should say. Uh, and then there's a tiny, tiny contingent in the UK. So, uh, it's, I'm, I'm glad to have discovered you. Obviously, you reached out to me um, through, I think, some mutual contacts. Um, so, no, it's good to finally be talking. So, just uh, just to kick this one off then, uh, I'd love to learn about your story. I know you've got an interesting story around some of the uh, health scares you had in the beginning. So tell us about you know your story, how you your kind of health and fitness journey, how you got into high intensity training, all of that. Wow. <laughs> um, basically, I was just super skinny, as I think most people are. Um, and my brother used to lift weights a little bit. So there was always a couple of muscle magazines lying around in the house. Um, but from being probably about 10, um, I got a massive obsession with Bruce Lee. So that sort of got me into the exercise thing, going to classes and, you know, seeing that he weight trained. So I did little bits here and there, but not a lot. Um, and then my auntie came over who lived in America and that's the thing that I remember most. She took me, I was underage, but she took me to see Commando with Arnold Schwarzenegger at the pictures. Um, and as soon as I saw him, you know, the cliche, but the scene at the start when he's walking down the hill carrying the log, if anybody's seen that film, and I just thought, wow, you know, that's how people should look. So <laughs> kind of from that point on, the, the martial arts kind of took a sort of a step back and became really interested in the weights at that point. Um so I started training quite a lot, to be honest, as people do. Um, but just in my mum's garage at home, started getting a few weights off my dad and um, and just kind of following routines, I think, as everybody does, the weeder routines, so Arnold stuff and um, all that type of thing. Um, but quite quickly realised that although you get results immediately, it kind of slowed down very quickly as well. And I was immensely thin. You know, when I left school at 16... I weighed about 100 pounds, that's all, um, at five foot ten. So I was, I was a skinny guy. Um, so it worked for a little while, as I say, as most things do. But, um, you know, I was spending a lot of time training. And just the way my head is, it was just always, how can I sort of make this better, quicker? Um, and a couple of muscle magazines that my brother had, there was a couple of articles by Mike Menzer. So I was really interested in reading those, but didn't really pay a massive amount of attention to it. Just it kind of got me thinking a little bit more. Um, and quite quickly, I couldn't tell you how, I couldn't tell you why, but I just started reducing things quite a lot. And I got to a point, believe it or not, where I was doing one rep per set. But I was taking a minimum of 30 seconds on the negative and the same on the positive. Um and tr dropped my training down from six days to four days and really, really quickly started putting on muscle. Um, don't get me wrong, my diet and things improved at the time as well, which, which obviously helps because I couldn't, I've never been a big eater. Um, How old were so you that, when you made this change? Um, I was 17, um, close to 18, to be honest. Um, and it was kind of at that point that I really wanted to do a bodybuilding competition. 
and I was working at the same time. So I needed the workouts to be much more efficient. Um, and as I say, I just started reducing things and slowing the repetitions down. Um, and that just started to work for me unbelievably well. Um, and from being sort of not really putting anything on, you know, I competed in my first bodybuilding competition at 18 and I was 12 stone, two pounds on stage from leaving school at 16 at seven stone ish. So, um, and most of that was when I really reduced everything down, you know, the muscle came on, but I don't want people to think that I were a good gainer because I wasn't, it was just that I wanted it that bad. <laughs> so I trained very, very hard and I ate really, really well. You know, if it, if it meant getting up in the middle of the night to eat a tin of tuna, then I would do that. Simple as that. Um, so I did these couple of competitions, um, but then kind of realized that the workouts were still needed to be improved quite dramatically. Um, so just played around with things, you know, went back to normal repetitions, but still controlling things a lot more. Um, reduced down even further. So I was training about three days a week rather than four. Um, again, kept improving the nutrition the best that I kind of knew how. There weren't a lot of things about then, you know, to work out how to do that. So it was just trial and error, really, which is most people's how they do it. Um, and then really got obsessed at that point that I wanted to be a professional bodybuilder. Um, I spent some time living in America with my auntie. I went and lived there for a little bit. So I trained out there, met Mike Menza. Um, which was amazing, and a few other people. Um, and just, to be honest with you, understood it, but still didn't fully understand it because um, kind of that's when the health scare happened when I came home, um, which I don't know whether you want me to go into that. Oh, or, yeah, please. Well, um, but give us, um, just so we know where we are in time, how old are you at this point? Um, I was, when I had the health scare. Yeah. Um, I was 24. Okay. So yeah, no, please go into that. 25. Yeah. Basically, I started where I couldn't, um, I was waking up quite a bit through the night out of breath. Um, and my girlfriend, who is now my wife, kind of realized that I was hold, what appeared to be holding my breath for quite a long time, you know, while I was asleep. Um, didn't really think anything of it, but I was putting a tremendous amount of weight on at that point. My workouts, as I say, were greatly reduced. The intensity was too high. I know people, I know we're going to get into all that, but people say you can't train too hard. You can. <laughs> you, you really, really can. You know, when people say if the volume's low enough, as I say, we can talk about that later, but um, the training I was doing was pretty ridiculous, to be honest, at the time. Um, but no matter what, no matter how I felt, I had to go to the gym and train as hard as I could. And basically, just to cut it as short as I can, just one day, I was just really out of breath. I walked down into a place um, where I was living at the time and couldn't get back up the hill to my house. Um, so I sat down on the sofa really out of breath and my sister came and she just went, you're going to the doctors whether you want to or not. So she took me there straight away. And literally within about a minute, he run a couple of tests. He listened to my heart and things like that. And he, he just started scribbling on a piece of paper as fast as he could put it in my hand and said, get to the hospital as fast as you can with no explanation. So my sister drove me to the hospital as quick as we could. We got in there, they started running tests. And a nurse kind of said to me that you've probably just overdone things, you know, your heart's beating quite quickly and things like that. Um, but it quickly became apparent that that wasn't the case. Um, there was a lot more going on. At first I thought I had a blood clot on my lung. Um but it quickly changed to um, there was something sort of vastly wrong with my heart at the time. Um, until eventually after all these tests, a doctor came in at night, basically apologized for how long things had taken. But he said because of the sort of muscle mass that I was carrying at the time, my body weight, a lot of the tests had struggled to be able to to pick things up as easy as, as, as they can on someone that doesn't work out. And basically, he just said to me that my heart was about the size of a carrier bag and it was like a carrier bag blowing in the wind. There was just nothing to it at all. And basically, just to say goodbye to my parents is <laughs> right. basically, what, basically what he said to me, yeah. yeah. Um, because there was just no chance. There was just nothing they could do. Um, so obviously, trying to take that in were difficult. Um, my parents came in, obviously, um, devastatedly upset. Um, and obviously we did that. We had to kind of say, you know, this is going to be it. 
Um, they did quite a lot with me through the night. And still to this day, the doctor didn't know how, but I was still there the next morning. Um, so my parents were allowed to come back and see me. Um, and they just did everything they possibly could, you know, which was amazing. I had some amazing people there and they don't know how, but within about a week, there was some small recovery taking place. So they basically took me in a room with my mum and dad and said, his only chance really is a heart transplant. So we'll get him on the register as fast as possible. And that's when they kind of explained to me, as I said, I don't want to, I know it bore your viewers going into it too much, but no, they, basically, no. they basically said to me that, um, the heart you've got, if you put it in terms of say 50%, which is what they say is about average of the function of what the problem with the heart was. When I came in, mine was just under three. So I should basically have not been alive. Basically at about three to 5%. It goes on what they call um, a reserve, which is how your body tries to keep you going as best it can. And he felt that I'd been living on this reserve way past my time, basically. Obviously I got the typical you know, what steroids are you using, growth hormones? I got attacked by that forever. When I said I wasn't, they just didn't believe that. At that time, I was very heavy. Um, How heavy? I was 19 stone, three pound when I went in. Um, so Jesus, basically... What, of like how much of that was body fat and what... Don't get me wrong, there was body fat. You know, <laughs> there, there was enough body fat, don't get me wrong. I mean, I got heavier than that. My wife used to call me Craig Two-Face because my head was that big. Right. Um, but... Um, you know, I'd like to think a lot of it were muscle, you know, um, and I'd put a lot on quickly. Um, as I say, we can, if you, we can go into that, you know, when we talk about training, what I was doing at the time, because I put a rapid amount of weight on. So I understood the steroid thing. Believe me, I did understand that fact. Um, but yeah, so basically within about, I was in intensive care for three weeks, which is unheard of, they said at the hospital. But basically after about three weeks, my heart function had gone back up to about 10% which they really couldn't understand how or why that was happening. Um, eventually, um, a doctor from, um, I'm going to say Taiwan, I'm not 100% sure, but a gentleman called Dr. Tan, they actually brought over to see me. He was like the, the leading guy in the world, they said at the time whether that were the case, but to do with like athletes with heart issues. And he was massively interested in the case because no one, and still to this day, as far as I'm aware, has got to that point and actually ever come back from it. Um, but he, he felt when he came over that it was the size of me that probably helped, believe it or not, although that could have been part of the issue. He said the amount of muscle and body weight that I was carrying was that my body could almost feed off itself to try and keep itself going much easier. Um and I just kept recovering from there. They really don't know how or why, as I say. The only thing is, um, the training, he really understood. He didn't understand it, but he understood the, the level I'd been pushing to, um, which he said definitely contributed to it. Um, but I'd also had glandular fever about 18 months before. And they didn't know whether I'd gone back to the gym maybe a little bit too soon and then gone back to training quite hard, probably a bit sooner than I should, and whether it had affected my heart a little bit and that just carried on. Um, and and basically just recovered from there, which, you know, we're not really sure how or why, and I'm still still here today to be able to sit and talk to you. <laughs> so, how much of it do you think or know was a genetic component? Nothing. They didn't feel it was anything to no do with genetic. history. You've got a massive family history of heart issues, but it was all more when there was people, there was sort of in the 50s and 60s, and it was more heart attack type based, nothing to do with like ventricular problems to do with heart failure. So they didn't feel there was any any issue there at all with that. So are you quite a bit lighter now, I assume? I'm about, um, at this moment in time, so I've been doing a little bit of dieting recently, I'm about 17 and a half at the moment, so... <laughs> And you're five ten, five ten, yeah. <laughs> you're still a big but I'm guy. Still carrying, yeah, still a little <laughs> bit of body fat there. Don't get me wrong, but, um, but I'm trying to get rid of that at the moment. So I've come down from probably about eighteen and a half since the beginning of the year. It's so, just yeah, interesting. Work. Yeah, it, it, because um, it's interesting what you, the doctor said there about. I mean, we know, um, and we've certainly explored this on some of the podcasts that um, you know, muscle mass. It can improve and increasing your muscle mass, increasing your strength through resistance training can improve the health of the cardiovascular system. Mm -hmm. um, in that, it my understanding is that it 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 almost means that it's less work. 
for the cardiovascular mm-hmm. system because you're stronger and because yep, you're more yep. capable. But it's my understanding that you can obviously put on, you can put on too much muscle and create too much um, demand. I'm, I'm not sure if I've explained that very well, but uh, I don't fully understand it, to be honest. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, it sounds like it's a bit of a mystery to you and some of the experts at the time. The so. doctors still don't know. I actually spoke to one of the doctors not that long ago. It's probably a couple of years ago. And he said, I'm still the only case. So they really still don't understand how or why what happened, really. So they do apparently use me quite a lot, you know, in in things to it, you know, as a as a strange situation that happened once. Like uh, yeah, yeah, I suppose so. But um, yeah, I, I I think it is a mystery, really, what what went on. Yeah. All being said, though, um, doesn't surprise me that your level of musculature may have been somewhat helpful. Um, you know, because I mean, I've had Doctor Doug McGuff on multiple times, and and Doug's quite popular for talking about uh, myokines which um, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with, which is secreted by muscle and mm-hmm. improve the health of all your organs. So I'm wondering if that's part of this. Um, I'm Could sure be. Doug Could might... Very well be. Yeah, I mean, Doug might listen to this and uh, may give some feedback. Uh, I might even ask him because uh, I think he'd be fascinated by this because he's, yeah, yeah. he's... And many, in fact, of my guests and listeners are have this rare blend of knowledge of understanding high intensity strength training and you know training really hard and training with a lot of advanced techniques which sounds like you did and we'll get into yeah, that yeah the, the, the training was it, the only way i could explain it was stupid really okay. if, if i'm honest i kind of i knew what i was doing but i almost couldn't help myself because at that point i wanted to be sort of the best bodybuilder on the planet so in my head that was if I train harder than anybody else ever has, that has to happen. And that just isn't the case. Um, but at, at 24 years old, I didn't understand that. It was just a case of just do it, you know, whatever yeah. it takes, just do it. And especially without the fact that I wasn't using steroids at the time, I felt I had to do that much more. And don't get me wrong, this is not, if people are listening that take steroids, I'm not, you know, that's everybody's choice. Um, and I'm certainly not sat here with and going to lie and say that, if I'd have had to take them, that I wouldn't have done because I wanted to be the best at the time. So if that's what was required, which it probably would have been at some stage, then yes, I would have done that. You know, I'll openly say that I would have done that. Um, but, you know, it just at that time, I just felt by building as much muscle as I possibly could before maybe having to go down that route, that gave me the advantage over everybody else. You know, that, that was my, my thought at the time. So what um what type of stuff were you doing? I mean, when you said you were doing ridiculous training in my head, mm. I'm thinking lots of negatives, you know, lots of like advanced techniques. I mean, can you talk about what your routines were like around then? Yeah, I mean, um, they're still very short, you know. Believe it or not, I was training each body part every two weeks. Um, so and I was only training three times a week. Um, so the whole body was covered over six sessions. So you you would sit and think, wow, you know, I'm giving enough recovery time probably. I know we know better than that now. But even in my head, then I was thinking, you know, this is quite a bit of recovery time compared to most. But the, the, yeah, to give you an example, my wife, if she was here, she could sort of say, but I'll, I'll never forget one particular movement. I love hack squats, which I know a lot of people might say are bad for you for this and that and the other. Um but I, I vividly remember being at a gym that I trained at at the time and I would literally hack squat to the point that I couldn't move the weight anymore with her help. I would get off, throw up into a bucket and get back on and try and do more. And I would probably do that a couple of times. Um, and I can remember that that and probably leg extension would be my quad workout. But I would literally also remember being carried to the car pretty much to have to drive myself home because I felt that bad. You know, and that that's just, I think the thing is, we all think, and as I did, if I trained, you know, um, did every technique possible and pushed the muscle as far as possible, it has to grow as much as possible. But it's not the case um, because every resource I had was being used up on just getting me through those workouts and getting me over it to probably be able to train again. Um, but I should have known there was an issue in the sense of that at the time, um, with with carbohydrate powder, I was having a thousand grams of carbs a day, um, and 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 that literally was because when when I saw the doctor about the heart, he said at that point I shouldn't have been able to get out of bed, 
but I was still going to train. But I just thought it was the fatigue from the workout. So my carbohydrate content was beyond belief just to be able to get me about, you know, with the energy. Um, but yeah, it was just that type of thing. I would basically just train to a point that I just possibly couldn't do anymore. You know, I, I really couldn't do anymore. Um, but it's it's not good for you. <laughs> it's just not good for you. So just to clarify then, it sounds like you were kind of doing something similar to Mike Mentz's consolidated routine. Is that was that kind of part of it? Um, not really, okay. because I was still doing isolation exercises, as I say. So my quad workout might be like a set of hack squats and a set of leg extensions. Um, at that time, I wasn't doing a pre-exhaust superset. Um, I think I probably was leg extension in first. But as I say, I took it to such a degree, the set that I probably needed 10 minutes before I could even do the hack squat, <laughs> you know, and then by the time I'd done the hack squat, you know, I, I needed help to the car to go home, basically. Um, and then I would stay up however long it took to eat the meal that were required to, you know. But on the other hand, I think the thing that was, which people don't talk about much because we kind of talk about negatively how we don't grow, we don't get stronger. I was still getting stronger at the time. You know, I was lifting some phenomenal weights at the time. Um, for me, anyway, I, won't, I don't want to say everyone, but for me, there were phenomenal weights. Um, for good, good amounts of reps in really good form. Um, and I was getting bigger. You know, my heaviest body weight after the heart problem, I've been up to 20 stone, four pounds at my heaviest. Um, and for a guy that started at seven stone, you know, it, it, it can be done, but it's just how bad you want it to be done you know i know there'll be people out there arguing well genetically i must have been able to do that um, and probably to some degree maybe yes but every ounce of muscle that i've got i had to virtually die for <laughs> you know to put it on I, you know well that's where so i was going to sort of challenge you a little bit is you said um you know 16 17 seven, 16 you were skinny and was it uh, 100 pounds and in 17, you started doing high intensity training. You know, there's a, from my understanding, there's an enormous amount of development that happens between naturally, you know, if you did no mm -hmm. training between 17 and 25. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was there, in that range, you see. Yeah. Of, yeah. So yeah. it's a good time to be, uh, to be training as well. And there's a certain, but it, I mean, I'll never forget even at that time because high intensity is so misunderstood. Everybody thought I were nuts. Oh, I bet. You know, because I'd probably be in the gym maybe 15 minutes, yeah. 20 minutes, and the workout were done. And everybody used to come up to me and go, you, you're crazy. You look like you're going to die while you're training, but you're in here for 10 minutes and then you're gone. And But I remember we've got some photos. Uh, maybe if we do this again, I can. Um, but basically, I've got some photos from being 14 and a half stone um, when I was, um, tw well, exactly, I was 22 and a half years old. And at 24 uh, years old, I was 17 stone. So I stood in the same place, you know, to show the difference. And right. people kind of stopped saying I were nuts at that point because of how much I'd put on, you know, in that. Per but that, I think the, the issue of weight gain then, I went from 17 stone to 19 stone three within about six months then at that point. So I'd put a, tra a massive amount of weight on, you know, over that, over that period of time. Yeah. And calories weren't that high, believe it or not. Mm. You know, people would say I'd have to be eating six, seven thousand. I wasn't because I can't do that. You know, I just can't do that. Because I'm not, you know, um, I know that. <sighs> so, you know, I was just, I recently finished reading. Are you familiar with Martin Burkan, Lean Gains? Does that name mean anything to you? Mm, no. So no. mine's a very popular figure in yep. um, health and fitness. He's, okay. he's, he's quite interesting because he's, um, like you, he's incredibly dedicated. Um, and, you know, he's got a very... He's got a very scientific base to everything he says. He's quite well researched. He's basically the um, founder of intermittent fasting. He pretty much invented okay. that. And I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, sure yeah. you're familiar with that. Um, yeah. So that's like his baby, really. Um, and leangains.com is his website. And I, I like a lot of his writing, a lot of his stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and what's interesting about him is he was a, uh, he's a I think he's Swedish. And he was, um, he was a fitness model in his teens and he was quite, <laughs> he was quite a chubby teenager. And then he got really lean for being, to be a fitness model, uh, or, or then became a fitness model because he got lean. Um, but he was like, you know, a hundred and, uh, I, I would say, uh, I think he was around 155, 160 pounds at six foot one. So, you know, pretty, pretty lean, pretty skinny. Yeah. 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 Uh, I say skinny. I don't want to say skinny because no, I think, no, no. I think yeah. you can be healthy and in excellent shape at that. I still believe at that weight. Yeah. Um, cause I'm not far off that, to be honest. Now he then over a period of 
20 years, so he's, this was when he was 16, so he's 35 now, he put on um, a lot of weight. I mean, we're talking, he was, I be, oh, I'm, this is testing me now because of my memory, but I think he was 70 kilos. And I think now he sits at around 90, 95 kilos. And he's yeah. shredded to the bone. I mean, he right. looks unbelievable. Right. He is the envy of a lot of the fitness nation in right. terms of, I mean, yeah. obviously I'm not, not that. <laughs> no, no, I, I get that. I, no, no, I'm not, not yeah, trying to draw yeah, a comparison. I'm yeah, just trying. No, no, I just no. wanted yeah, to. Yeah, I just wanted to. This is kind of a, a preamble to the question, the, the discussion. But um, yeah. you know, for a lot of people, he is a. You know, people admire his physique, and he's often. You know, he often says like how hard he worked for it. And when you look at it, if you think about it, okay, twenty years, he probably. I mean, because the, the my understanding is that you'll put on. Uh, if you're very determined and you eat right and you train hard and all of that, um, you're going to put on. Obviously, your noob gains, your 30, you know, 20, 30, 40 pounds in the first couple of years. And then after that, maybe a few pounds a year. And then eventually, it's literally going to be a slow grind of a pound a year. But if you look at training over a lifetime, that can add up to be quite a considerable amount. And if yeah. you look at Martin Burkan, I think if you work that out, it's something like a kilogram a year uh, mm. averaged out over his training career, um, which actually it looks quite realistic when you break it down like that, which I think is quite interesting to me. So how, if you don't mind me asking, how old are you, Craig, now? At 48. Okay. So you've been training for what? How many years? 25? Wow. Yeah, more than that. Yeah, yeah. yeah more 30, than that. Yeah. 30, yeah. 30, yeah, yeah, 30, yeah. 32, yeah. 33 years? Yeah, probably like? about 30 years, yeah. My math's being tested there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so... Because it's, it's, it, don't get me wrong, it's, it's quite hard for me sometimes to believe like you were, uh, 100 pounds and now you're like, you know, well, you know, 17 stone, you said now. About what's 17 that, and a half at the moment. In, what's that in pounds? Then? Um, it'll be about, uh, wow. It'll be about sort of 245 maybe ish wow. around that. So the heaviest I've ever been were 284. Oh, wow. Okay. So now here's a very personal question. You don't have to answer this and probably should have mm-hmm. asked this before we started. Yeah, but what's your, what's your body composition at right now, do you think? If you uh, had to oh, guess, body fat. Um, I don't know. I mean, if you go by the scales that I've got at the gym, uh, <laughs> it's so difficult, isn't it? That? I mean, <laughs> I'm carrying fat. <laughs> there's, there's, no, there's no question about that. I'm not the fattest guy in the world, for sure. But um, yeah, I, I would probably say that I'm, I'm, I'd am i certainly probably need to take, um, if I was going to compete again, looking at from competitions past and things like that, I would probably, there'd certainly be, um, I'd have to take 20 pounds off, to be realistic, to look at being somewhere like, getting ready for a competition so the you know there's there's enough fat on there don't get me wrong but um it depends as well i mean i, t- I tend to carry fat around my waist um and my head <laughs> my head blows up but um my legs are always super lean um you know if i if i started dieting properly now it won't take very long for my legs to get in shape at all because they, they just don't um so it's i'm more one of those guys even at the body weights of like the 20 stones it was more around my waist where I carried it. I wasn't particularly fat anywhere else. I'm just unlucky in that sense. And that's one of the toughest places to remove it from as well. So I used to have to diet very, very hard, you know, to get it off that. But as I say, the, 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 um, there'd be, there'd be quite a sum to come off at the moment. But, you know, I've, I've competed before, um, you know, sort of 225 things like that so so here's a, a better question then um at 225 when you competed what body fat percentage would you have been around that point i mean if you're on stage what you must be like sub 10 percent or oh, definitely definitely yeah. sub 10 percent yeah definitely. so therefore you you know from the age of 16 to when you competed that's 125 pounds gained mm-hmm. which um, i totally understand now everybody's going to say liar steroids well and and, and and, and yeah. do you know what? I'm, I'm just, if anybody knows me truly, if I'd done that, I would just say, because I have no problem with that. I have literally no problem with that. I'm not one of these people that, it's the thing I hate most is when people are doing natural competitions and they're taking something. For God's sake, just do a show where people take take things. It's like there's millions of them. You know, it's, um, but I do put it down to the training. I'll always put it down to the training and I'll I'll always put it down to, that no one wanted it more than me, and that oh, yeah. sounds re- that sounds really arrogant and big headed. And I mm. apologise because hopefully people know me. I'm not that, but 
I would literally have died for it. You know, when I used to go in the gym train back then, it was a case of if I die in here doing this, then that's what happens because I just wanted it that bad. And I think a lot of people, the genetics is a massive factor. I totally agree. But people's bodies can go way beyond where they think it can if things are done correctly. And I think that's where people fall short is most people don't do things correctly. No, it's really interesting because one of the things I remember, um, you know, talk, interviewing a, another guest I had on the show, a, a, a scientist called Dr. James Steele, is he told me about, I'm not sure how, you know, trying to recall this, I'm not sure how good a job I'm going to do of explaining this. But um, he talked about how there's, there's like two base, there's like two spectrums. There's a genetic spectrum in terms of, how blessed you are just baseline. Yep. Now, there are people yep. there are people who will never walk into a gym who will carry more muscle mass than I will and yep. train my whole life, right? Really annoying um, people. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, and there are yeah, I mean, yeah, we can go into that. But then and then there's another spectrum of um people that are incredibly strong responders to training. So even though they may have which is again there's another bell curve, right? So even mm-hmm. though they may have um, people who don't look like they can gain much, when they actually start training, their response is quite profound. And again, yeah. it's another spectrum. So I wonder if you may be someone who, you know, started off with a, a, a poor hand, so to speak, in terms of, uh, you know, muscle mass. But when you actually trained, your body responded better than maybe the average uh, and maybe that's and and that's not taking away from your work ethic. It's just trying to because 125 pounds is incredible, mm-hmm. in my opinion. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, but yeah, I wonder if that's um, a, that's a possibility. Yeah, maybe. I'd, I, as I say, though, the gains only really came when the training changed, because the food at the time that I was sort of 17, 18, 19, the food didn't change that much because I have that poor an appetite. Um, so the gains really came when I. Hugely reduce the volume, increase the intensity, and um, but yeah, as, the strange thing with me, um, which I'm sure people, as you say, have dug my go for anyone listens to that is, I'm kind of strange in the sense of that um, I tend to get fatigued systemically very quickly, but the muscles kind of are okay. In I know they recover, the muscles recover much quicker than the system, but. I could go in the gym still back then, particularly still feeling very, very tired, not knowing any better, particularly and train. And I would be stronger than the workout before, but on myself, I felt exhausted. So whether there's a genetic trait there as well to do with the muscle recruit, you know, there's so many factors to it, but I, but I genuinely could, you know, when people say they're going in the weaker and it's not as good a workout, I could, I can, I can still go in and train very, very hard, even if I'm very, very fatigued. And push myself and push myself, you know. So um, whether that has something to do with it, I don't, I don't know. But I, t- I totally understand where you're coming from. But as I say, the gains were next to nothing until the intensity stepped up and the and, and the volume greatly re- reduced. Yeah, no, it's interesting. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, you do, it still sounds like you have an enormous amount of uh, sort of mental toughness as well from what you're saying there. Yeah, well, it sounds really bad, that because I, I, I hate to say because you come across no. as arrogant, don't you? But it's just it, it's just one really. Yeah. You know, when I go in the gym, even now when I'm training now, I, I want to do as best as I possibly can. I don't want to walk out of that gym knowing there were half a rep left or. You know, it's just how I am because I'll be annoyed at myself and it'll eat me alive. So I have to leave it in the gym. No, I uh, I completely respect that. Um, it, yeah, I mean, good, thanks for being a good sport, by the way, because I have so many skeptics that listen to this podcast, and I, I'm, I'm actually very grateful for that because they keep me on my toes, and um, it always provides a very thoughtful um, discourse following the podcast, especially in the, the comments and the blog and some of the emails I get. Um, so I know they would be uh, asking the same question. So I am. Um, yeah, I'm, sure asked- I'm sure I'll get attacked. Oh, well, I mean, maybe, I'm kind of used to that now. Kind of oh well, that. then then you've got the thick skin for it, which is good. But but yeah. it's not it's not so much that um, I hope you. It's not so much you get attacked, but I I think you know debate and and constructive criticism and all of that is a healthy Absolutely. thing. As I as I said to you at the start of this, um, you know, the, to the listeners, Craig was saying, oh, I hope I try not to offend anyone. I'm like, no, people need to be offended. People need <laughs> people need to have their paradigms challenged. I certainly do. So uh, no, it's, don't hold back. Um, yeah. No, that's really interesting. Thanks for going for all of that. Thanks for um, uh, you know answering my my challenge as well. Yeah. Um, so 
one thing, okay, so one thing I want to talk about quickly is um, the kind of high intensity training community in the UK for a moment. So I have some listeners in the UK, obviously the majority over in the, the US and Canada, and, and I have a global listenership, but majority are, are in the US. Um, and there is a few, you know, a few of us uh, high intensity training fans and studio operators in the UK. What's your feeling about um, high intensity training in the UK? How have you found you know, trying to promote this way of training? Like, what's your thoughts around that? Difficult. Mm. Um, because most people don't believe in it. Um, I, to be honest with you, if I, uh, I own a gymnasium. So I train people high intensity style, if that's how what we call it. But um, most people are very skeptical uh, until they do it. And then the people that tend not to come back usually go, well, it didn't work for me. Or, um, but I just think most people don't like it <laughs> because <laughs> it, it ain't nice. There's no point sitting here and saying it's nice, you know, <laughs> going in and training for when people say to me, Oh, you know, I'll leave it all in the gym. I go and train for two hours. Well, no, you didn't, you know, in two minutes, maybe I'd believe it if you went in and, and killed yourself. But, um, you know, doing five sets of leg extensions for 10 reps each and building up a nice pump and lactic acid is nowhere near as nasty as doing one set, but pushing it to the point that no matter what, your head's going to blow off. You can't do another rep. Um, and I just don't think most people want to train like that. Um, but I think people, if they stick to it and they realize how quickly they can get the results, then... Um, but I just think in the UK in particular, we, we are still very skeptical to it. But I think part of that is, is if people do, tra- I, to be honest with you as well, worldwide, I don't think people, I think the word muscular failure is bantered around a little bit too often. You know, I've watched people train and, you know, you get your professional bodybuilders, oh, I do three sets to failure. And then you sit and you watch them on a video, you know, and, and failure is like two years away from where they put the weight down. You know, it, it, you, you know, talking about the high intensity techniques, I do use them. But I use them not very often because when you push someone tough muscular failure, positive muscular failure, um, they've pretty much had enough. You know, if you really push them to the point that they have gone to, you know, as you'll know about yourself. Um, and I just don't think people like it. So I don't think it's widely received very well, mainly because of that. And, and, and obviously, as you know, with the magazines and, you know, no one really does that. Everything's about, you know, eating 6,000 grams of protein a day and being in the gym for five hours a day, isn't it? Which is what sells. Um, so I think it is probably a very small community. Yeah, I think it's probably a small community worldwide. But, um, and I don't understand it, if I'm honest, because, you know, probably the greatest bodybuilder to walk the planet, Dorian Yates, trained in a manner high intensity style. So why more people don't do it? I just, I just think they don't like it. I just think it's too hard. I think when they watch Dorian train on a video, they go, what are you nuts? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's just, you know, a lot of the pros, because if you watch most pros train and I do, I'm not meaning to sound disrespectful in any sense of the word, but when you watch most of them train, it's not that hard. It's just for a good period of time, you know, and it, it um, and you would have thought maybe some of them would have watched Dorian and thought, well, you know, we're the best in the world six times. Maybe I should be looking more to, but, but you know, they, they just, um, they just don't do it. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I think I, I honestly think part of it from what I've seen over time is, is that people will give it a go, but I just don't think they like it. And then they'll come up with every excuse in the book as to why it's not working. I always ask this question because I'm always so fascinated. Why do you think you were uh, converted, <laughs> uh, for want of a better word, um, and, and didn't just... Because I'm sure you had peers around that time who were training more traditional, three yep. sets of 10, you know, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger style, uh, yep. you know, twice a day. So yep. what, why you? Uh, well, as I say, at the time with work and other factors, I needed the workouts to be shorter. Um, and I've always been one of those people that tried to look for a better way of doing things. So I kind of fell into it by accident by most of the things now, if I read Mensa and things, it's very similar, but I didn't actually follow anyone as such. It kind of just came about over time um, by accident. Maybe how I picked things up and thought, well, that's working. That's not working. Put that in, remove that. Um, and just because again, um, not to sound funny to people, but I used to watch these people in gyms train for hours on end and not really change. And my brain used to say, well, if that's really the way to do it, then why aren't they changing? You know, and people used to walk out of the gym every day with an amazing pump. 
which is what a lot say is required, and yet they're still never changed. You know, I have guys come in my gym that um, they get great pumps and they eat really well, but year on year they don't particularly change. So um, I just knew something was wrong and there had to be something better. That's That were kind of it, really. And as I say, once I started doing them workouts, I res- you know, the response was much better than the volume. Um, you know, I-, I could see a difference much more quickly. So I think once you visually see a change and other people comment that they've seen a change, I think it's very easy then to stick with something and, you know, and, and do that, which is what I tended to do. This episode is brought to you by our sponsor, ARX. Are you looking to create a cutting edge, high intensity training facility? Are you confused on what equipment to use or how to separate yourself from the masses? Well, then ARX Fit might be the answer you're looking for. I asked Mike Palano from ARX a few questions about how ARX machines are challenging the status quo of the exercise industry around the globe. Mike, if you could, Give the listeners a quick summary of why ARX is so different from the traditional machines or tools they're used to seeing in most exercise facilities. ARX is totally different than anything you've seen before. This isn't just another weight stack machine. We've looked at the last 40 years of exercise technology and used that knowledge to create something entirely new. ARX uses a new form of resistance, a motor, and we pair that motor with computer software so that we can maximize the safety, effectiveness, and efficiency of your workouts. So you may be asking, okay, but how does ARX compare to weights? Traditional machines you see in gyms today are based on lifting metal weights and battling gravity. What people don't realize is that when you're forced to lift a static weight like this, one that doesn't adapt or change while you use it, you're underloading yourself rep after rep. And this unnecessarily limits your ability to make improvements. With ARX, we've taken a totally different approach. We removed weights and gravity from the equation altogether. Instead, ARX combines our patented motorized resistance with our custom computer software to provide you with the world's safest, most effective, and most quantified form of resistance training ever. When you train with ARX, you are training to your perfect level of resistance, both positively and negatively 100% of the time. No more guessing what weight to use, ARX does all of that for you, instantly and automatically. We'll also track and measure every second of every rep, so you can quantify all of your workouts to find out if you're improving and by exactly how much. Whether your goals are bigger muscles, increased strength, stronger bones, or just to look good in a bathing suit, ARX can help you achieve all of these and more, but do so in a fraction of the time it would take compared to traditional equipment. If you're looking for the most efficient, most effective, and most quantified piece of exercise equipment on the market today, then look no further than ARX. Thanks, Mike. That all sounds really impressive. If you'd like to learn more about ARX, visit arxfit.com and mention that you heard about ARX on the Corporate Warrior podcast to receive an exclusive deal of $500 off shipping and installation off your ARX machines. Cool. Um, let's dig into this, uh, into a little bit more about, um, I guess, actually, you know, before I get into routines and, and, uh, thoughts about that, um, what do you, what do you like about, what do you, what do you dislike about the high intensity training community, if anything, or the high intensity training, um, paradigm? You mean with individuals or just how it's, well, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, share your mind. I mean, individuals, community-wise, and also uh, exercise um, views and recommendations. I think it's. I think people just need to be a little bit more open. I think a lot of people are very, it, it, you know, this is it. And, you know, if you don't do that, then don't talk to me anymore. You know, I just think um, most people are going to do their own thing. Um, but if you can steer them in a, in a bit of that direction, at least, I think is... So I think... Um, and I think no one challenges things much anymore. I think they'll maybe read some, you know, that I'm doing a, a rep that takes 20 seconds. Um, and that's definitely the way to go. And it's the only way to go. And, you know, and it, it's not, you know, I've used sort of every technique in the book. Um, and I know if we talk about training a little bit, how I train now and things, there'll be a lot challenge that, 
I know the world because I've had that a lot before. Um, but I have the experience on myself and I have the experience of training a lot of other people that it's worked very, very well for. So it's not just based around me, you know, just training myself or I've used these things with, with a lot of other people that have got really good results. So I think it's just that. I think you've got to be a little bit open. So, you know, we all require the same stimulus. There's absolutely no question about that. I don't care. I'll argue till I die over that, that we all, just as, as Mike said, we all require the sun to get a tan. No one can question that fact. We all require high intensity exercise to build muscles, but we're all very, very different in how we respond to that and how we recover from that. And I think, um, don't just, I think the trouble is most people think they know high intensity and they really don't. <laughs> that sounds really bad, but you know, you see so many online and things now, or I'm training people high intensity style. No, you've probably watched a Mike Menzer or Dorian Yates video and you're training them how they train. Doesn't mean you understand, you know, what's required or what's, how much rest does that person need after? Um, so I think that's the issue. I think there is a very small community, but I think a lot of the community, probably think they know a lot more than they do, which is probably really brutal to say, but um, there's a lot more to learn for definite. Um, and I think a lot of very in a box of this is it. And, and, and that's that. And to a degree, they're correct, you know, but um, try it yourself and see what, you know, whether 10 seconds works for you or, you know, um, because, I, you know, as I've just said, I don't want to sound like I'm contradicting myself there because the thing I hate most is the non-high intensity guys who say it's a load of rubbish, it don't work. Uh, we're all different. They're the people I hate most. We're all different. Um, but then what you should do is train like me like this. Well, I'm not just contradicted <laughs> that we're all different. Um, but what I mean is we're all different in the sense of, I know I'm getting a bit off topic here, but we're all different in That's the right. sense of, you know, bench press might work exceptionally well for me. It might not for you. You might be better on an incline. Um but the stimulus needs to be the same. Um, but then, you know, I could maybe train chest on Monday and it's okay to train the Monday after. You may need till the Wednesday after. They're the factors that people need to get correct. You know, not that you have to squat. If squats don't suit you, squats don't suit me. I got to be a very heavy squatter, but my back used to hurt all the time. I had to focus so much on technique just to be able to stay upright enough that I ended up with little injuries from it and I persisted and persisted and my legs never got great. And, it, it, you know, so we have to find what works for us in the sense of, you know, you can't sit down and just go, well, squats, deadlifts, bench press, amazing exercises. But if they don't suit you, these other ways of building muscle and these other movements. So I just think we're very, we're very in a box. And I think people tend to look at it and think, well, it's, it's just that. And if I don't do that and that's not for me, then, you know, I'll leave it alone. And it's, it, we've got to get people out of, of that sort of feeling really that it's about, it's about a number of factors, but getting those factors to suit you, you know, so. Um, again, not contradicting because we are all the same, but we are different in a genetic makeup of, like I say, bench press may work for me, just may do nothing for you. You know, it may just injure your shoulders. So you need to incline bench or you maybe need to decline. So we've got to get those factors, get the recovery factors and things like that sorted out mainly. And then people will grow. There's no question of that. You know, I've seen that a million times, but you've got to get those factors correct. I can't just go, right, we'll all squat. We'll all deadlift, we'll all bench press, we'll all be freaks. Just don't work like that, unfortunately. You know, I respond way better to hat squats than I do barbell squats. And I know people go, oh, they're dangerous, they'll blow your kneecaps off. Well, well for me, no, I, you know, my, my quads respond a lot better to, you know, a full range hat squat than they do to a barbell squat. And I don't get back pain, you know. So I just think the community is so engrossed in it has to be this that people look in and go, well, no, I don't, uh, that's not for me. You know, and they'll, they'll follow volume because there's kind of a million routes to volume, isn't there? you know, this, everybody does volume. So I can try this in a million different ways. So I, I think that's one of the issues we've got to get away from that we all agree in the sense of how things um, work, but then we've got to work out how that works, particularly for that person. Yeah. And no, that, will bring, that will bring more people into it then. Yeah, well said. Um, you know, I don't want to um, 
uh, talk too much, I guess, about the the community. I do I do agree with what you're saying, um, but <laughs> I, I'm I'm becoming aware that I'm bringing this up probably too much than is even productive uh, on in a, yeah. in a podcast, um, yeah, yeah. in in certain other podcasts as well. Um, I did one with Dr. James Fisher where we kind of addressed some of the challenges and the the infighting and stuff like that. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. But but I, I I agree. I think you know obviously the principles are the same, right? Regardless, but mm-hmm. it's the nuances, it's the details that you uh, adapt to your own. Uh, personal workout and the way you respond and things like yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, the thing I read a lot, um, and I know Mike was into that, so I will, I know I'll get people definitely sort of, you know, want to ask about this, but I don't personally agree anymore with the positive part of the movement being really slow. You know, I'm not into exploding as hard as possible because that tends to cause injury and you do build up momentum. But I, 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 you know, just, just as one thing that we're talking about, but I do feel that you should be driving through the positive because without questioning myself and people that I train, the muscles grow quicker and grow bigger when you're driving through the positive than when you're going through it slowly. And I know that everybody will come at me over that because when they've done it on charts and they've done it scientifically, that the more muscle involvement of when you're moving slow, but there's definitely a um, immune system response and things like that when you're, you're moving at more of a rate through the positive. I'm not talking about using momentum, you know, um, or anything like that, but you really need to drive through that positive part of the rep. And I pause at the bottom, I pause, which I know people don't necessarily believe in, but I do pause um, at the full stretch position for a second to ensure momentum don't build up. And I pause in the contracted position if it's that type of movement. And the negatives are always under control, top to bottom. But then I do believe in driving through the positive because for me, if I do the slow reps, the muscles tend to look a little bit more conditioned if I do that, you know, but actual size wise, I don't really gain a great deal. I don't, um, no matter what recovery period I allow, I don't particularly get stronger from it. I start to get stronger when I'm driving through the positive, but my workouts are still all the same. So I'm not stronger because that one week I exploded a lot more through the positive. You know, I still keep everything the same. So I know I'm getting stronger because workout and workout is the same. But I know that there'll be loads say that I'm talking nonsense there. Well, but that, that, that is, uh, you know, you, what you said there is highly controversial. controversial. It but, is massively, massively. I understand that. I mean, where I would challenge you on that is I don't think there's any difference. I mean, right. Yeah. you know, I just did a podcast with... Uh, uh, Brandon Yonker, who was the former operations director over at Discover Strength in the US, um, mm-hmm. who are a chain of high intensity training studios, um, mm-hmm. owned and run by, uh, Luke Carlson now. And, um, yeah, you know, they, yeah. di- they did a study, uh, a while ago on cadence. So they compared, mm-hmm. they compared 1010 to 44 to uh, various other cadences. Yeah. And, you know, as you'd expect, well, based on my, my uh, you know, me, me leading up to this, is, is there was no difference in yep, yep, muscle I've hypertrophy. Read that. I've read right? that, yep, yep. Uh, Obviously, you know, there's, there's, there's some flaws to the design maybe. And I, I can't remember. We did actually go through the, the design flaws in the study, uh, but mm-hmm. it was a while ago. Uh, I think one may have been the, um, the duration. You know, this is the problem, right, with a lot of the science in training is the duration. It's difficult. Yeah, to, it's, it's very difficult to get absolutely. people to, or to to measure people accurately and control variables yeah, over a long period of time. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, like, and I know, you know, and, you know, I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical of a lot of things we're talking about. Uh, and I know the list is going to be skeptical and they're going to think. Of course. I how, totally appreciate that. Right. Yeah. But I guess the big question here, or the million dollar question for me is how do you know that? So, you just you're just going on feel, right? When you say, "Oh, I respond better when I do this," it's just um, no, because to... um, these many changes that happen, the size of the muscle stops increasing when I'm doing slower positives. And um, there's no question about that. Um, I will change significantly physically to look at when I'm doing a more powerful positive. And it, as I say, people can argue with me all day long about that, but that's a, that's just a simple fact. And that's okay. most people that I train as well. Um, there is a definite change um, because I, I think it's I know there's it's difficult to say isn't it but I know there's um, it's like throwing a ball you know the ball's going to go a lot further if you use some power 
Um, so we can use the fact that, yeah, you're using a lot more momentum. But I'm not training in that manner, as I said. I don't use momentum. When I'm talking about drive, I'm talking about driving through the positive as hard as I can with oh, I no momentum you. and things building up. Yeah, it's but, you know, middle. If, if you, yeah, but if you stood in the garden now and threw a ball at the fence, slowly, it's not going to go very far. But you use, you use some thrust. The ball's going to tank on a little bit. You know what I mean? So more fibers, it, to a degree, for me, have been recruited there. Now, I know everybody will come back and attack me and say, well, no, that's not the case because there's momentum, there's so many other factors included of, of changes in body positions. And, you know, we can go on about those things all day. But the, for me, there's a definite increase there when you're using some drive through the positive. But as I say, I don't want people to then think that I'm talking about blasting through the positive. Oh, they don't. With absolutely, yeah. you know. Um, but, and, and as I say, that's not just me, that's people I've trained. The strength increases come a little bit quicker, which causes, is definitely positive to do with muscular growth, as you know, you know, progressive resistance. There's so many factors. So um, I'm sure that I will get, you know, oh, yeah. a lot over it, but... <laughs> Um, for me, it's a fact for me. There's no question about it that for me and people that I train, that works better. Yeah. No, I respect that. And, um, and, and I get what you mean. I understand the, the clarity you're trying to provide there and that it's not explosive. Yeah, even I think Mike the Menzer listeners get one, that. Yeah, mm. even in Mike Menzer in one of his, um, in one of his books actually explained that, that sometimes, I know it's probably towards the end he changed that completely. But if you go back to one of his older books, he actually, some of his training, um, again, I'm sure people disagree and say I'm wrong, but you know, I could get the book out, one of his heavy duty books of that when, um, at the bottom position of a movement, he sometimes increased the speed to drive back through the positive. And again, he brought up the similar type of thing of throwing a ball of how you get that hitch into it and it allows a bit more, you know, for you to be using maybe a little bit more weight on the movement, which again can cause more muscular growth. So, um, but there's a fine line in there between um, using muscles and using momentum, which which I'm, I'm deeply against. Yeah, likewise. Um, so tell me about like, what's your current routine at the moment? What, how, is your, how has your training evolved as you've uh, experimented on yourself and learned more about strength training? Uh, the routine's similar to my book that I've got out routine. Um, nice the only plug. thing that, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, I couldn't have done that. <laughs> no, that's um, fine. It's just in case anyone has it. It's kind of, so, the only thing that I don't do anymore is, um, I don't deadlift at the moment because I've got a bit of a back injury, um, which really annoys me because it's my favorite exercise is deadlift. Um, so very, very low volume. Um, I do use isolation movements periodically here and there, uh, but obviously ma- mainly compound um, because you're still trying to build as much muscle as possible, and those movements tend to tend to do that because you're using how the body should work is is with multiple muscles moving, not obviously um, a bit a bit like sort of the consolidation routine, I suppose that you're talking about with Mensa. Um, so, as a quick example, say if I train back. If I did do more than one exercise um, and I did use an isolation exercise, I'm very privileged that I've got a Nautilus pullover machine at, at, at my gym. So um, my routine on back at the moment would be I will do um, – I'll warm up first on the on the first exercise um, depending on how the weight I'm using is how many warm-ups I'll do. But they are warm-up sets. There's nothing stressful there. Um, and then it will be one working set of a T-bar row usually for me because I really like that exercise with a reverse grip. Um, I'll just push that as hard as I can to positive failure. Periodically, I may do a thing, I may do a rest pause, which I personally like rest pause technique. I think it's probably the best technique out of all of them. I do use partials here and there a little bit as well. Don't do negatives too often um, because I tend to use a good negative all the time. Um, I always um, statically contract for a couple of seconds, you know, like at the top of the of the T-bar row, and I'll pause for a second at the bottom again to reduce momentum. So that will be that. Uh, usually, as I said, just to positive failure, but probably with a partial repetition on the end on the T-bar row. Um, and as I say, periodically, maybe a rest pause. And then I'll move after resting as long as I feel I need to be as good as I can after that. So I'm usually in a bit of a state after that. Um, I'll do a set of Nautilus pullovers. Um, same sort of manner. I wouldn't rest pause that movement. 
Um, but that would be taken to, to positive failure with, with possibly a partial repetition on the end. That would be back done. Simple as that. So how many exercises up. was that? Just, two. Or just so two? T-bar row, okay. T-bar row pullover. Um, normally I'd do rear delts that day as well and possibly biceps. So I would do one movement on rear deltoid and then one movement on biceps and then I'm out of there. Like a single joint on the biceps, like a curl or something like that? Yeah, I'd probably do... I like standing cable curl. I like that exercise. So I'll probably use that and I'll use some form of rear delt cable movement or something, you know, for, for rear deltoids. And, and then I'm done. I'm out of there. Simple as that. Okay. What about your other workouts? Um, the other workouts would be push and, and legs. So legs, um, my leg routine 99.9% of the time will be um, a set of hack squats, um, a set of leg extensions. The only reason I don't necessarily do leg extensions first, because I know people will question that, is because just for me personally, um, I'm quite strong on leg extensions. And I've kind of got to a point now of adding more weight to the machines, just becoming a little bit um, dangerous. So I can still use quite a lot of weight even after the hack squat. So I tend to hack squat first um, because I can still isolate very, very well on that exercise. So I'll do a set of hack squats. I'll do a set of leg extensions after the proper rest. Um, Then I'll do a set of um, lying leg curls for the hamstrings. Um, And then I do a set of toe press on the leg press for calf because I really like that movement. And then I'm out. That's me done on there. Um, and chest will be, um, this is me including the isolation exercise. I don't always do these, but I'm just giving what would be like a full workout. So everybody knows if I did do that. Um, again, I will do, um, a set of, um, low incline bench press, um, on the Smith machine, usually for chest, um, followed up by a proper rest. I'll do a set of cable crossovers because I really like that movement for chest for me. It suits me well. Um, deltoids then i've only got the side and the front delt to do because obviously rear was done with back so i really really like cable side laterals um so um i tend to do those for the side deltoid now the front deltoid i do do um a smith machine front press military press sometimes but not all the time because the front deltoid tends to get a lot of work you know like from the um smith machine incline yeah i was gonna say yeah, a lot of people end up with issues with um, the rotators and things. It's usually because they're massively overworking the front deltoid. So, But I do like to shoulder press here and there because I do like the exercise. So I'll do it periodically. But if I don't do that, I'll do a front raise, usually on a cable because I prefer it, um, with a straight bar. Um, and I really like that exercise. So I'll tend to do that. Um, and as I say, put the, pr- the press in. Maybe if I'm feeling really good, you know, if it's a day when I'm feeling really, really good and I think, you know what, I could probably do a really good front press here, I'll put it in um, and then I won't do it again for a few weeks. You know, it'll be a front raise instead. Um, And then I'll finish uh, with a tricep push down and that's my three workouts done. And they're not on a daily basis. Obviously, there's plenty of days recovery in between each workout. How much recovery recovery in between? Um, And probably at the moment, training each body part around every 10 or 11 days. At the moment, it probably works out. So I'll, I'll train um, two or three days off, train again. So like mm, three times a week in terms of overall absolute, frequency? Absolute max. Absolute right, max. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, absolute max. Three times a week. It sounds like um, uh, we're quite similar in terms of our uh, ability. I mean, we're not similar in terms of body mass. That's, I'm probably half what you weigh, but um, <laughs> but uh, hey, I'm, I'm, you're a lot leaner than me. Uh, I can see. Well, well you know, I'm, 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 yeah. I've got some years. I've got some years to catch up as well. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, no, I'll be I'll be asking for tips. No, um, but uh, I, I, similar to you, I, I I find you know I've got a, I've got a friend who does. Um, uh, you know, full, and the listeners will know who I'm talking about, Dr. James Steele, might as well name him. Uh, he, he does a, a very impressive um, full body, um, body weight workout two to three times a week or one to three times a week currently. Um, you know, lots of chin-ups, push-ups, body weight rows, wall sits, all that type of stuff. Um, and, you know, that for me, um, having worked out like that in the past, I found that's too much volume for me in a single session. In that, I, I find that I find that. But I think the larger you become as well, the harder that gets. Okay. You know, the stronger you become and things. Um, as I say, systemically, it kills me. Right, you know, I can I can right. do a set of hack squats 
you know, I'm dead after it. You know, literally, I can train people sometimes and, and push them really hard. They'll do a set of hat squats. Three and four minutes later, they're ready to do the leg extension. There's no way I'd be ready to do a set of leg extensions three or four minutes later. You know, I'm still probably laid on floor for ten minutes before I can do that. So okay. I think the, the, there's a lot of dep- you know, there's a lot of differences there, and that's what we were talking about before. That you, it's what suits you. You know, running to the next exercise, or but trying to do your whole body in one workout. I massively appreciate what they're saying, and it works very, very well. But to do a dozen exercise in a workout, I could not do it. If I'm pushing myself as hard as I can, there's no way that I could do that. Yeah, this no. is this is the the thing because um you, the the caveats here obviously if you're new, uh, then by definition you aren't as strong and you probably don't have the ability to recruit as many muscle fibers and fatigue yeah. your full spectrum muscle fibers. Um, but you also will increase recovery in ability at that time. But there's a point mm-hmm. when his recovery ability doesn't increase anymore. Right, it's not so, in proportion to yeah, your strength. Absolutely, right? yeah, absolutely. So, 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 but, so, so us, if I was going to yeah. do, sorry, if I was going to do like a what you'd call a full body workout, which I do do sometimes if I'm limited for time, I will perform a set of hack squats, I'll perform a set of T-bar rows, and I'll perform my set of incline mm. chest press, and that's my whole body works because those three movements will, to some degree, work the entire body absolutely so that would be that would be like a whole and and then then in those three movements i can give them everything i've got but then if you said to me right Craig, we're going to go do a set of you know shoulder press we're going to go do a set of, I, just, I wouldn't have it in me and for me if i'm not giving 100 percent on each exercise then for me it's just a waste of time it's just a pointless exercise for me yeah and so yeah no i agree and i guess what i was trying to say is um i think you know, at the start, pretty much all of us can cope with the higher volume at the beginning of our training career. Um, so it's always, it's quite unusual for me that, uh, to see someone like James, who's able to, uh, and I, I believe he still does between maybe five to 10 exercises per workout. I'm mm-hmm. the same as you. Like if I'm going to go to true muscular failure and you talked earlier on in this about how much of a cliche that's become because. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I totally agree. Um, and there's a lot, there's a lot in the, again, like I said, the last thing I want to do is offend people and I'm not attacking people or, or any, and I hope they understand See that. Too late for but that. This, yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> but there's a lot of people in the high intensity community that think they're trained to muscular failure and they don't. Mm. They really, really don't yeah. because, again, that sounds really brutal and I'm kind of wishing I hadn't said it now, but they really, really don't, you know, because... You've you got to back kinda, it up now, Craig, of a video. Kinda, yeah, you can kind of tell... Do you know yeah. what I mean? How people are quite chipper after they've done a set. And, <laughs> you know, if you're not dying, then something's wrong. You know, you should really be in quite a state after a real set of muscular failure. You know, if someone comes up to me to talk to me after I've just put a weight down, I ain't speaking to them for two minutes because I ain't, I ain't got it in me to speak to them for two minutes. Yeah. You know, so. But it is, the, it is also, part. there is, because um, I, I interviewed uh, Ryan Hall, who runs uh, Exercise Science Gym over in the US. And um, we talked about how there are, differences in terms of and i might be getting this wrong but some people are more glycolytic in that like you and i for example perhaps who you know we only have to do a few exercises and we're destroyed um yep. assuming all things are the same in terms of intensity right so let's yeah, say yeah, we yeah. train the same level of intensity but then there yep. are people that are more oxidative that have more endurance like you know my partner yeah, absolutely. right absolutely. Like my partner isn't he still train hard well i mean it's impossible well I, I sometimes challenge her. I'm like, did you really, you know what I'm saying, right? Like, did <laughs> oh, you really no, no, no. go to fate? Oh, <clears throat> well, yeah, exactly. That's why um, I've learned to, uh, I've, I've improved my communication skills as the uh, the, the, the boyfriend personal trainer. Um, yeah. <laughs> I want to, I want my relationship to last. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but she will, she will go to she'll say she'll go to failure and I'll, I'll challenge her on that. <laughs> um, but yeah. I, I've kind of, I mean, you might disagree with this actually, because I am kind of contradicting what you're saying, but she'll say to me, like, you know, I am exhausted, but her physiologically, when you look at her, she's not, you know, there's no carpet time. There's no like, no, she can barely no, no, talk. No. She's tired. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I do think there's some variability there. Absolutely, I do as well. Yeah. But I, I do feel though that if um, almost anyone, if they say came to my gym and we did the set of hack squats, the set of T-bar rows and the set of chest press, there'd be very, very few people wanting to do something else after that. 
Right. Okay. Very, oh, yeah, very few would really be wanting to to do much more after that. Because if you could, you probably haven't put enough into those three movements. And that again is me not attacking anyone. And I'm not saying people couldn't, like you say, I'm sure there is some. And probably I could have done a few years ago, maybe, you know, uh, um, because like you say, you tend to be able to take exercise a little bit better sometimes when you're a bit smaller and other factors. Um, but I think if you're putting it in, very, very difficult to do many more than say like three movements or something in a workout where you can really stonk at it and give it everything you've got. You know, yeah, I, really, I agree. Really do. I mean, I, I can go yeah. into the gym. I could go into the gym tomorrow and do a set of T-bar rows and very comfortably just leave. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm that ruined, I could just go, you know what, yeah, I've had enough. Um, I wouldn't. I'll finish the workout probably, but <laughs> it's one of those. I could very easily go in and do one movement. Uh, you know, when I was deadlifting, I could comfortably do a set of deadlifts all out and leave. You know, because, you know, when you get to a point that you're bleeding from your eyes and <laughs> it's time to go home. At that point. But, um, you know... It, I just think it, sometimes it's the level of intensity in it as well. It's, you know, people, some people can get maybe an extra rep that, um, again, we can talk about how much people want it as well. You know, you, as, when you train a lot of people as I do, you can see that sometimes, you know, and they get annoyed with me with there's, there's another rep there. Well, I've done that rep. Yeah, but there's another one. You know, they get annoyed at me of that, but you kind of over years, you have to judge that. Because you genuinely, you know, you can, we have this laugh every week when oh, I hate you because you've made me do three more when you said there were only one more. But sometimes you'll say to someone, there's one, there's another rep in there and that rep goes up easier than one before. Right. And it's yeah. almost they're just fooling themselves that they're reaching failure, you know. And the, the thing with this training is what people always have to understand is that you have to train very, very hard if you're going to do a very, very small amount. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, and I, I think people also need to change their mindset as to not how much they can endure in the gym. It's not about that. It's about doing exactly what's required and getting out. And if a set of T bar rows is all that's required to muscular failure to stimulate back growth, get out. <laughs> You've done your job. You know, it's not about, well, yeah, but I could force myself to do, you know, and then I really feel like I've done It's not about that. You've got to decide do I want to be in the gym for two hours and not grow? Or do I want to be in for five minutes and get body that I'm after? You know, you've got you've got to make that. And I just think that a lot of people think they train hard and they don't. And again, I don't want that to come across as arrogance and that I'm attacking people. But a lot of people believe they train harder than than they do. And don't get me wrong, there's some people out there that really, really do push themselves. But the other factor of high intensity, as I said before, is also knowing when enough is enough as well, because you're not you're just breaking yourself down further beyond a certain point, which all your resources are going to be used up in just trying to get over that fact. You know, your body, the trouble with a lot of people is I think they think that an immediate response is, wow, he's trained me really hard. I'll pack some muscle tissue on. That's the last thing your body's going to do. It wants to get over what you've put it through first and get back to where it was before, you know, and I think people forget that fact. And if you've, if you've as Mike used to put it, if you've dug the hole too deep you know getting back to where you were before is going to be difficult enough your body's got nothing left to put a little bit of extra on top of that filled in hole you know people need to understand that cool um just uh, aware of time craig so i want to i know sorry i've been giving some long no no, no no this is this is uh this is great it's uh it's really interesting so maybe we're um, good to do it again so we could do, at some point to be able to, to to do a little bit more maybe absolutely. if that's possible yeah, yeah. I mean, there's so much stuff to touch on in terms of training. Um, but I want to talk to you. Do you want to quickly let listeners know about your business? So um, tell us about your business quickly. Yeah, I own Potential Gymnasium. As I say, I've got um, a book out called Potential. So the name of the gym came from that, really. I just followed that on. Um, so we are just a normal sort of a normal gym. But we try to get most people training high-intensity style, if that's possible. And I do PT there. So obviously, that's all based around high-intensity training. Um, and I do get people ready for, or, or help people anyway, get people ready for competitions and and things like that. So, um, But I'm hoping to expand a little bit more. I am thinking about doing a YouTube channel, possibly, which I've been thinking about to try and get high-intensity out there a little bit more and, and, and other factors. So... I'm kind of wanting to just spread my wings a little bit, which hopefully this may be the start of 
of doing that a little bit if people don't hate me too much after today. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> which is always a possibility. Um, so yeah. Um, but yeah, we do, I, I do PT. We try and get people more onto the high intensity style training. I certainly won't train people in any other manner. Um, and we have a lot of people in the gym that do train in a high intensity fashion. Um, a lot more than any other type of training. So. Yeah, so it's it's good in that sense, um, but it would obviously be nice to get to a, a broader audience. Yeah. What well, what's your Instagram account again? What's the? Uh, just poten- at potential gym. At potential gym, all one word, isn't it? Yeah, I, I would encourage the listeners to follow you because you've got some wonderful athletes and some crazy physiques uh, in your. Yeah, we gym. do have some good guys. We have some really good and ladies as well. Yeah, we have a, a, yeah. a broad. Yeah, we do. Yeah, and, and that really yeah. put the work in as well. Yeah, and so if you want some inspiration for your high intensity training, then go there. I would I recommend that. And what's the book called? Uh, Potential. Potential. Okay, just potential. potential which they can get on Amazon and lots of other places, but they can get it direct from me from the gym. So okay. I sent, um, as I say, a gentleman and a few other people recommended from the US when I sent the book out there of your podcast. So that's how I found out about them um, at the time from those guys. Once they read the book, they got back to me and said, you know, you'd, you should contact this guy and, and take it from there. Cool. Yeah. Uh, and I'll, I'll put obviously all that in the show notes for you guys listening. Uh, as I say, get... hopefully, YouTube fingers crossed at some point. Yeah, yeah. So. No, I, I think that's great. I think uh, it's really cool to hear um, anyone who wants to promote high intensity strength training, you know, um, in their own way, I think is a, is a great thing. So no, I, I, I know we're going to be talking a little bit after this and, uh, yep. hopefully stuff like this can inspire you to, uh, to, to get that, get that going. Um, so, so, okay. So what is, uh, what's the best way for the listeners to contact you, Craig, or find out more about you? Um, probably Instagram is probably the best at the moment. You know, we are on Facebook and things like that, but I do tend to put, I've kind of got onto the Instagram thing now because it's just easier for me at work to get on, you know, and, and put it on there a bit quicker, which does share straight to Facebook as well. So they can find it on there. Um, just or, like I say, just contact me there or contact me at the gym, you know, just contact me at Potential Gym. And, um, you know, I get private message quite a lot through there. So if they, they can do that as, as often as they want, which, I'm sure I'll, there'll be a few wanting to have a go at me after today. <laughs> well, um, look, so. you know, it's uh, sometimes being being authentic, and if that's a bit controversial, that's not always a bad thing. Because yep, there will be some people that might course, hate you for I'm, it, but there'll be yeah, people. I'm sure there will. There'll be people that love you as well. You know, one or two. Maybe. And I, I'm I'm in the I'm in the latter group, Craig. Oh, so. that's great. Thank you very much. That's okay. Then. <laughs> so, so that's all that matters. No, um, yeah, so, absolutely. So, don't worry. Um, it's uh, it's all it's all part of life. Um, I don't know why I said that. It's, just, it's supposed <laughs> to sound quite profound, but I don't think it means anything really. Kind of uh, silly. Um, but yes, no, Craig. Thank you so much for joining me on the show. And um, my pleasure. We'll, we can do it again. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And um, to find for the listeners to find the the blog post for this episode, please go to corporatewarrior.co forward slash potential. Um, and for all episodes, please go to corporatewarrior.co forward slash podcast. And until next time, guys, thank you very much for listening. Discover how to improve health, become a great personal trainer, and build a successful high intensity strength training business. Check out corporatewarrior.co. Corporatewarrior.co. This episode is brought to you by ARX, the most innovative, efficient, and effective all-in-one exercise machines I have ever seen. I was really impressed with my ARX workout. The intensity and adaptive resistance was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I love how the machine enables you to increase the negative load to fatigue target muscles more quickly. And I love how the workouts are effortlessly quantified. The software tracks maximum force output, rate of work, total amount of work done and more in front of you on screen, allowing you to compete with your previous performance to give you and your clients real time motivation. The ARX uses a computer-controlled motor to give you the exact amount of resistance your clients need 100% of the time. This means that the resistance can never become dangerous, is intuitive and simple to use, and can provide you with all of the results you and your clients are looking for in a fraction of the time. ARX is highly effective and efficient in delivering all of the benefits of exercise, including increased strength, muscle mass, cardiovascular conditioning, bone mineral density, and injury recovery. 
as well as being utilized by many high intensity trainers to deliver highly effective and efficient workouts to their clients, AirX comes highly recommended by world class trainers and brands, including Bulletproof, Tony Robbins, and Ben Greenfield Fitness. To find out more about ARX and get $500 off install when you place an order, please go to arxfit.com and mention Corporate Warrior and How Did You Hear About Us field. So again, to get $500 off install when you order, head on over to arxfit.com and enter Corporate Warrior and How Did You Hear About Us field. <laughs> 